Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and this is For the Record program number 480, titled Plum Island, Lyme Disease, and the Eric Traub File. This is being recorded on October 3rd of the year 2004. In this program, we're going to take a look at a possible connection between Lyme disease, a, a very debilitating disease carried by ticks that is, began in the East and is now spread around the United States, and Plum Island, a U.S. Department of Agriculture research facility in Long Island Sound that also doubles, or has doubled in the past, as a biological warfare research facility, and a fellow named Eric Traub. Eric Traub was in charge of bacteriological and virological warfare research for the Third Reich. He reported directly to SS Chief Heinrich Himmler, and then he was brought over to the United States at the end of World War II as part of Project Paperclip, in which uh, top Nazi scientists were recruited in order to work for the U.S. National Security Establishment. And we're going to examine a possible connection between Traub's research, uh, ticks contaminated or carrying Lyme disease, Plum Island and the spread of that disease abroad, or uh, off of Plum Island, I should say. We're going to be taking a look, uh, or relying for our uh, material in this broadcast, from a book called Lab 257 by Michael Christopher Carroll. It's subtitled The Disturbing Story of the Government's Secret Plum Island Germ Laboratory, published in hardcover by Morrow Books, copyright 2004. And uh, the full uh, detail, all the details, ISBN number, etc., will be in the description of four for the record 480 when that is up. Now, about the recruitment of Eric Traub by the U.S. at the end of World War II, we read from Lab 257. Near the end of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union raced to recruit German scientists for post war purposes. Under a top secret program codenamed Project Paperclip, the U.S. military pursued Nazi scientific talent like forbidden fruit, unquote, bringing, bringing them to America under employment contracts and offering them full U.S. citizenship. The re recruits were supposed to be nominal participants in Nazi activities, but the zealous military recruited more than 2,000 scientists, many of whom had dark Nazi party past. Parenthetically, the best known of uh, these recruits were people like Werner von Braun and the other rocket scientists who helped to pioneer the American space program. Werner von Braun was an officer in the SS. Continuing, American scientists viewed these Germans as peers and quickly forgot they were on opposing sides of a ghastly global war in which millions perished. Fearing brutal retaliation from the Soviets for the Nazis' vicious treatment of them, some scientists cooperated with the Americans to earn amnesty. Others played the two nations off each other to get the best financial deal in exchange for their services. Dr. Eric Traub was, tr was troubling on the Soviet side of the Iron Curtain after the war and ordered to research germ warfare viruses for the Russians. He pulled off a daring escape with his family to West Berlin in 1949. Applying for Project Paperclip employment, Traub affirmed he wanted to, quote, do scientific work in the USA, become an American citizen, and be protected from Russian reprisals, unquote. As lab chief of Insel Reims, a secret Nazi biological warfare laboratory on a crescent-shaped island in the Baltic Sea, Traub worked directly for Adolf Hitler's second in charge, SS Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler. And uh, skipping down. Just months into his paperclip contract, the germ warriors at Fort Detrick, the Army's biological warfare headquarters in Friedrich, Maryland, and CIA operatives invited Traub in for a talk, later reported in a declassified top-secret summary. Quote, Dr. Traub is a noted authority on viruses and diseases in Germany and Europe. This interrogation revealed much information of value to the animal disease program from a biological warfare point of view. Dr. Traub discussed work done at a German animal disease station during World War II and subsequent to the war when the station was under Russian control. By the way, uh, Traub did uh, much of his research uh, in the United States, continuing pre-war research in the United States. Ironically, Traub spent the pre-war period of his scientific career on a fellowship at the Rockefeller Institute in Princeton, New Jersey, perfecting his skills in viruses and bacteria under the tutelage of American experts before returning to Nazi Germany on the eve of the war. Despite Traub's troubling war record, 
The U.S. Navy recruited him for its scientific designs and stationed him at the Naval Medical Research Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. By the way, uh, I would also note that uh, Traub's Nazi affiliations were uh, already very much present uh, and, and on the public record well before World War II. Uh, in this uh, referring to his participation in the Nazi Motorist Corps called the NSKK. In fact, NSKK's first member joining in April 1930 was Adolf Hitler himself. Traub also listed his 1930s membership in America Deutscher Volksbund, a German-American club also known as Camp Siegfried. Just 30 miles west of Plum Island in Yafank, Long Island, Camp Siegfried was the national headquarters of the American Nazi movement. So again, uh, Eric Traub had a, an, a strong American assignation well before World War II. Now we're going to take a look at how Traub and Plum Island, a USDA uh, animal disease research facility, came to hook up. Skipping down again. Everybody seemed willing to forget about Eric Traub's dirty past, that he had played a crucial role in the Nazis' cancer research program, the cover name for their biological warfare program, and that he worked directly under SS Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler. They seemed willing to overlook that Traub in the 1930s faithfully attempted Camp Siegfried. In fact, the USDA liked him so much it glossed over his dubious past and offered him the top scientist job at the new Plum Island Laboratory not once, but twice. Just months after the 1952 public hearings on selecting Plum Island, Doc Shahan dialed Dr. Traub at the Naval Laboratory to discuss plans for establishing the germ laboratory and a position on Plum Island. By the way, before continuing, parenthetically note that the Nazis' uh, biological warfare program was under the rubric of cancer research program. Uh, in our many programs dealing with AIDS, such as RFA-16, and some of our discussions with people like Ed Haslam, Dr. Leonard Horowitz, and others, we've taken a look at how it appears that the Special Viral Cancer Research Program in the United States was actually a cover for, among other things, biological warfare research and may have yielded, among other things, AIDS. And uh, there's a, sub a disturbing body of evidence indicating that AIDS was deliberately created. Continuing. Six years later, and only two years after Traub squirmed in his seat at the Plum Island dedication ceremonies, senior scientist Dr. Jacob, Jacob Traum retired. The USDA needed someone of outstanding caliber with a long-established reputation internationally as well as nationally, unquote, to fill Dr. Traum's shoes. But somehow it couldn't find a suitable American. Quote, As a last resort, it is now proposed that a foreigner be employed. The Aggies' choice? Eric Traub, who was in their view, quote, the most desirable candidate from any source, unquote. The 1958 secret USDA memorandum, Justification for Employment of Dr. Eric Traub, unquote, conveniently omitted his World War II activities, but it did emphasize that his, original, his originality, scientific abilities, and general competence as an investigator were developed at the Rockefeller Institute in New Jersey in the 1930s. The letters supporting Traub to lead Plum Island came in from fellow Plum Island founders. Quote, I hope that every effort will be made to get him. He has had long and productive experience in both pre-war and post-war Germany, unquote, said Dr. William Hagen, dean of the Cornell University Veterinary School, carefully dispensing with his wartime activities. The final word came from his dear American friend, and old Rockefeller Institute boss, Dr. Richard Shope, who described Traub as careful, skillful, productive, and very original, unquote, and again quoting, one of this world's most outstanding virologists, unquote. Shope's sole reference to Traub at war, quote, during the war, he was in Germany, serving in the German army, unquote. Declining the USDA's offer, Traub continued his directorship of the Tübingen Laboratory in West Germany, though he visited Plum Island frequently. In 1960, he was forced to resign as Tübingen's director under a dark cloud of financial embezzlement. Traub continued sporadic lab research for another three years, and then left Tübingen for good, a scandalous end to a checkered career. In the late 1970s, the esteemed virologist Dr. Robert Shope on business in Munich paid his father Richard's old Rockefeller Institute, a, a Rockefeller Institute disciple a visit. The germ warrior had been in early retirement for about a decade by then. Quote, 
I had dinner with Traub one day, out of old time's sake, and he was a pretty defeated man by then, unquote. On May 18, 1985, the Nazis virus warrior Dr. Eric Traub died unexpectedly in his sleep in West Germany. He was 78 years old. A biological warfare mercenary who worked under three flags, Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, and the United States, Traub was never investigated for war crimes. He escaped any inquiry into his wartime past. The full extent of his sordid endeavors went with him to his grave. While America brought a handful of Nazi war criminals to justice, it safeguarded many others in exchange for verses to the new state religion, modern science, and espionage. Records detailing a fraction of Eric Traub's activities are now available to the public, but most are withheld by Army intelligence and the CIA on grounds of national security. But there's enough of a glimpse to draw quite a sketch. And what we're going to take a look at next is one of the uh, early contractees of Lyme disease, a fellow named Stephen J. Nostrum, who actually uh, wrote a letter to uh, the newspapers, and that helped to spur uh, a series of, uh, of, of people coming, for, a number of people coming forth about the disease. The account of Stephen J. Nostrum's infections in the, in the mid-70s, I began to feel like a man made out of glass, like someone hit me with a baseball bat and shattered me from the top of my head to the balls of my feet, unquote, the nuclear power plant guard recalls. Never in my life had I experienced such pain, unquote. His hands gnarled into contortions and his vocal cords weakened and then became paralyzed, rendering him mute. The left side of his body went numb. A rheumatologist misdiagnosed him just like doctors misdiagnosed the children of Old, old Lyme, Connecticut in 1975 with rheumatoid arthritis. Then, the neurological symptoms set in. He experienced violent mood swings where he would be calm one moment and bawling silly the next. A newfound sensitivity to light made him a prisoner in his home with the shades drawn and lights turned off. Noise was magnified a hundredfold to the point that the vibrations from a person walking across the floor were excruciating. His incessant, reflexive coughing was so powerful it broke three of his ribs and brought up large globs of blood. When he told the doctor he suspected he had the long misunderstood ailment Lyme disease, the doctor laughed. But with the help of his wife, a registered nurse, he diagnosed himself with 38 of the 40 symptoms of Lyme. Results showed he had some of the highest known teeters of Borrelia burgdorferi, burgdorferi, or BB, known in New York State. That, by the way, that's the microorganism that produces Lyme disease. Continuing, he was ordered to a hospital bed for intensive intravenous antibiotic treatment. The treatments for Lyme disease, which can range from oral antibiotics to massive weekly IV infusions, are like, quote, trying to put out a forest fire with a watering can, according to another sufferer. The symptoms subsided six months after the tick bite, but came back with new fury five months later. More IV antibiotics were prescribed. I remember sitting in my doctor's office and saying, Doc, you know, I think I'm losing my mind, unquote. His heart, trying to cope with the large doses of chemicals, was failing him, but he figured he had nothing more to lose. He was dying. Teetering on the edge, the security guard mustered up what little strength he had left for one last hope. A deeply religious man, active in his church as a lay minister for some 25 years, he turned to a higher power. I could no longer speak. As the joint pain became unbearable, this one finger hurt so much I wanted it amputated, and I asked the doctor to amputate it. I prayed to God, how do you expect me to preach when I can't speak? And he said, you have a typewriter, type. And I had one crummy finger left that I could move. It was the little finger on my left hand that I'm right-handed. He began to pinky type, letter by letter, click, clack, click, whatever came to mind. In the very first sentence, he punched the I key too hard, and it broke off and fell to the floor. Forty years old, and I began to cry like a baby, and no sound came out, unquote. He finished the letter, carefully penciling in the eyes. Again, quoting, it was the most humble letter I've ever written in my life, unquote. He didn't think anyone would even read the pathetic-looking, half-typed, half-scrawled epistle. But plucking Stephen J. Nostrum's letter out of the thousands she received each day, the nationally syndicated advice columnist Ann Landers not only read it, she printed it. What happened next was completely unexpected. Nostrum received hundreds of phone calls and thousands of letters from Lyme disease sufferers and their family members who shared his pain. Quote, 
People were actually calling up telephone operators to get the exchange for Matatuk, randomly dialing numbers beginning with 298 and asking, is there a man in your town with the initials SJN who's involved with Lyme disease, unquote? Buoyed by the overwhelming response, he began to help he- heal himself by helping others. He set up a makeshift command center in the basement of his home. Nostrum started one of the nation's first Lyme disease support groups. Guests from around the country came to his monthly gatherings at the local library. Through his organization, the Lyme Borrelia Outreach Foundation, Lyme Borrelia is the technical name of Lyme disease, he published a newsletter, sent out audio tapes, distributed literature, and hosted a monthly cable television program seen across the country. He spoke at civic associations, churches, and schools, and testified before a special U.S. Senate committee on Lyme disease. Skipping down. Next, Stephen J. Nostrum came across the book of The Ballara Secret by John Loftus, uh, the man we, uh, one of the people we spoke about in, uh, for the record, 479 that you just heard. And uh, John Loftus' Ballara Secret uh, basically uh, sparked an inquiry into the possible uh, Eric Traub Plum Island biological warfare connection to Lyme disease. Skipping down. Attorney John Loftus was hired in 1979 by the Office of Special Investigations, a unit set up by the Justice Department to expose Nazi war crimes and unearth Nazis hiding in the United States. Given top-secret clearance to review files that had been sealed for 35 years, Loftus found a treasure trove of information on America's post-war Nazi recruiting. In 1982, publicly challenging the government's complacency with wrongdoing, he told 60 Minutes that top Nazi officers had been protected and harbored in America by the CIA and the State Department. They got the Emmy Award, Loftus wrote. My family got the death threats, unquote. Old spies reached out to him after the publication of his book, The Ballara Secret, encouraged that he, unlike other authors, submitted his manuscript to the government, agreeing to censor portions to protect national security. The spooks gave him copies of secret documents and told him stories of clandestine operations. From these leads, Loftus ferreted out the dubious Nazi past of Austrian President and UN Secretary General Kurt Waldheim, parenthetically a good buddy of Arnold Schwarzenegger's. Continuing, Loftus revealed that during World War II, Waldheim had been an officer in a German army unit that committed atrocities in Yugoslavia. A disgraced Kurt Waldheim faded from the international scene soon thereafter. In the preface of the Ballara secret, Loftus laid out a striking piece of information gleaned from his spy network. Quote, Even more disturbing are the records of the Nazi germ warfare scientists who came to America. They experimented with poison ticks dropped from planes to spread rare diseases. I've received some information suggesting that the U.S. tested some of these poison ticks on the Plum Island artillery range off the coast of Connecticut during the early 1950s. Most of the germ warfare records have been shredded, but there is a top-secret U.S. document confirming that, quote, clandestine attacks on crops and animals, unquote, took place at this time. Eric Traub had been working for the American Biological Warfare Program from his 1949 escape until 1953. We know he consulted with Fort Detrick scientists and CIA operatives, that he worked for the USDA for a brief stint, and that he spoke regularly with Plum Island director Doc Shea in 1952. Traub can be physically placed on Plum Island at least three times, on dedication day in 1956, and two visits, one in, once in 1957 and again in the spring of 1958. Sheehan, who, who enforced an ultra-strict policy against outside visitors, each time received special clearance from the State Department to allow Traub on Plum Island soil. Research unearthed three USDA files from the vault of the National Archives. Two were labeled Tick Research and a third E. Traub. All three folders were empty. The caked on dust confirms the file boxes hadn't been opened since the moment before they were taped shut in the 1950s. Preposterous as it sounds, clandestine outdoor germ warfare trials were almost routine during this period. In 1952, the Joint Chiefs of Staff called for a vigorous, well-planned, large-scale biological warfare test program with all interested agencies participating, unquote. A top-secret letter to the Secretary of Defense later that year stated, quote, Steps should be taken to make certain adequate facilities are available, including those at Fort Detrick, Dugway Proving Ground, 
Fort Terry, Plum Island, and an island field testing area, unquote. Was Plum Island the island field testing area? Indeed, when the Army first scouted Plum Island for its Cold War designs, they charted wind speeds and direction and found that much to their liking, the prevailing winds blew out to sea. One of the participating interested agencies, unquote, was the USDA, which admittedly set up large plots of land throughout the Midwest for airborne anti-crop germ spray tests. Fort Detrick's Special Operations Division ran vulnerability tests, unquote, in which operatives walked around Washington, D.C. and San Francisco with suitcases holding Serratia marcescens, a bacteria recommended to Fort Detrick by Traub's nominal supervisor, Nazi germ czar, and Nuremberg defendant Dr. Kurt Blom. Tiny perforations allowed the germs release so they could trace the flow of the germs through airports and bus terminals. Shortly thereafter, 11 elderly men and women checked into hospitals with the never-before Serratia marcescens infection, the never-before seen Serratia marcescens infections. One patient died. Decades later, when the germ tests were disclosed, the Army denied responsibility. A Department of Defense report later admitted that the germ was, quote, an opportunistic pathogen causing infections of the endocardium, blood, wounds, and urinary and respiratory tracts, unquote. In the summer of 1966, special operations men walked into three New York City subway stations and tossed light bulbs filled with Bacillus subtilis, a benign bacteria, onto the tracks. The subway trains pushed the germs through the entire system and theoretically killed over a million passengers. Trials were also run with live, virulent, anti-animal germ agents. Two hog cholera bombs were exploded at an altitude of 1,500 feet over pig pens set up at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. And turkey feathers laced with Newcastle disease virus were dropped on animals grazing on a University of Wisconsin farm. The Army never fully withdrew its germ warfare efforts against food animals. Two years after the Army gave Plum Island to the USDA, and three years after it told President Eisenhower it had ended all biological warfare against food animals, the Joint Chiefs advised that, quote, research on anti-animal agent munition combinations should continue, as well as, quote, field testing of anti-food agent munition combinations. And, skipping down, at least six outdoor stockyard tests occurred in 1964 and 5. Simulants, simulants were sprayed onto stockyards in Fort Worth, Kansas, Fort Worth, Kansas City, St. Paul, Sioux Falls, and Omaha in tests determining how much foot and mouth disease virus would be required to destroy the food supply. Had the Army commandeered Plum Island for an outdoor trial? Maybe the USDA lent a hand with the trial as it had done out west by furnishing the large field tests. After all, the Plum Island agreement between the Army and the USDA allowed the Army to borrow the island from the USDA when necessary and in the national interest. Traub might have monitored the tests. A source who worked on Plum Island in the 1950s recalls that animal handlers and a scientist released ticks outdoors on the island. Quote, They called him the Nazi scientist when they came in in 1951. They were inoculating these ticks, unquote. And a picture he once saw, quote, shows the animal handler pointing to the area on Plum where they released the ticks, unquote. Dr. Traub's World War II handiwork consisted of aerial virus sprays developed on insel reams and tested over occupied Russia, and of field work for Heinrich Himmler in Turkey. Indeed, his colleagues conducted bug trials by dropping live beetles from planes. An outdoor tick trial would have been de rigueur for Eric Traub. Somebody gave Steve Nostrum a copy of John Loftus's The Ballara Secret at one of his support group meetings. Steve had long suspected that Plum Island played a role in the evolution of Lyme disease given the nature of its business and its proximity to old Lyme, Connecticut. But he never publicly voiced the hunch, fearing a loss of credibility. Hard facts and statistics earned him a reputation as a leader in the Lyme disease field. Now, in his hands, he had a book written by a Justice Department attorney who had not only appeared on 60 Minutes, but also had brought down the Secretary General of the United Nations. Nostrum disclosed the possible plum lime connection on his own television show. He invited local news reporter and Plum Island ombudsman Carl Grossman to help him explore the possibilities in light of the island's biological mishaps. Asked why he wrote about Loftus's book in his weekly newspaper column, Grossman says, quote, 
to let the theory rise or fall, to let the public consider it. And it seemed to me that the author was a Nazi hunter and a reputable attorney. This was not trivial information provided by some unreliable person. And this spurred a major inquiry, not only into Plum Island, but the possible connection with Dr. Eric Traub. Among the people who was looking into this was Mike Forbes, a congressman from that area, Congressman Michael Forbes. Forbes then asked Dr. Moon of Plum Island about the allegations in the Bolaris secret. And some of these investigations took place for a long, long time time. Uh, still later, uh, when uh, reporters were asking uh, Plum Island officials about the possibility of a connection between Eric Traub and the tick trials and Lyme disease, we find, if Dr. Eric Traub continued his outdoor germ experiments with the Army and experimented with ticks outdoors, the ticks would have made contact with mice, deer, and more than 140 species of wild birds known to frequent and nest on Plum Island. The birds spread their toxic cargo to resting and nesting perches atop the great elms and oaks of Old Lyme and elsewhere, just like they spread the West Nile virus throughout the United States. The U.S. skipping down. The USDA spokesperson Sandy Miller Hayes is unconvinced about the possibility of a link between Lyme disease and Plum Island. And uh, skipping down again. A PR expert, Hayes had Scientific American eating out of her hand in June 2000 when they reported her as saying, quote, we still get asked about the Nazi scientists, unquote, with the slightest trace of weariness creeping into her voice, unquote. In their feature story on Plum Island, the prestigious magazine dubbed the intrigue surrounding the island as a, quote, fanciful, fictional tapestry, unquote. Parenthetically, I would note that Scientific American is owned by the von Holtzbrink firm. Uh, the von Holtzbrink family were early uh, followers of the Nazi party, and uh, that they employed former Nazis, including a notorious SS man, to head up some of their uh, publications in the post-war period. So it should not necessarily come as altogether surprising that they would poo-poo the Nazi Lyme disease Plum Island connection. You know what, we're going to take um, just a short, just because I'm going to try to fit in one quote skipping down, of some of the details of the tick work conducted on Plum Island. The lab chief failed to mention that Plum Island also worked on hard ticks, a crucial distinction. A long overlooked document obtained from the files of an investigation by the office of former Long Island Congressman Thomas Downey sheds new light on the second, more damning connection to Lyme disease. A USDA 1978 internal research document titled African Swine Fever notes that in 1975 and 6, Contemporaneous with the strange outbreak in Old Lyme, Connecticut, quote, the adult and nymphal stages of Ablomna americanum and Abloma cayunes were found to be incapable of harboring and transmitting African swine fever virus, unquote. In layman's terms, Plum Island was experimenting with the lone star tick and the cayenne tick, feeding them on viruses and testing them on pigs during the ground zero year of Lyme disease. They did not transmit African swine fever to pigs, said the document, but they might have transmitted BB to researchers or to the island's vectors. The lone star tick, named after the white star on the back of the female, is a hard tick. Along with its cousin, the deer tick, it is a culprit in the spread of Lyme disease. Interestingly, at that time, the lone star tick's habitat was confined to Texas. Today, however, it is endemic throughout New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey and no one can really explain how it migrated all the way from Texas. It's really strange how that tick migrated all the way from Texas to New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey. It must have been really hard work. That concludes For the Record program number 480, titled Plum Island, Lyme Disease, and the Eric Traub File. This is being recorded on October 3rd of the year 2004. My name's Dave Emery. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and this is side two of For the Record program number 585, Lyme Disease and Biological Warfare. This program is being recorded on February 11th of the year 2007. This is the second program that I've done on the subject of Lyme disease and biological warfare research, and in fact, uh, side A was pretty much uh, in its entirety. A uh, recap of information from For the Record 480 from October of 2004. 
What we looked at in a nutshell was the research done at Plum Island, a U.S. Agriculture Department facility that also doubles as an Army Biological Warfare Research Facility, and the research done there on not only using ticks as biological warfare disease vectors, but uh, also the work done there, and in fact, the role in founding Plum Island of Dr. Eric Traub, who was in charge of virological and bacteriological warfare research for the Third Reich in World War II, and then uh, was brought over to the United States under the auspices of Project Paperclip, and did uh, similar types of research at, uh, in the United States while traveling back and forth between the U.S. and Germany. There are indications that Dr. Traub may have been involved with the use of ticks as disease vectors on Plum Island and possibly elsewhere. And there is a possibility that the use of infected or, quote, poison, unquote, ticks may have led to Lyme disease, whether there was a deliberate test of uh, Lyme disease as a biological warfare agent, or rather whether research was being done on it and it accidentally escaped. Uh, Plum Island had very, very poor security facilities, and in fact the uh, security facilities there were really quite shocking, and the accidental escape of disease agents that they were researching would be altogether possible. Then again, there's the possibility that things may have been deliberately disseminated either as a test or perhaps by hostile uh, foreign agents or by related fifth column agents in the United States. Who knows? But whatever the case, uh, with regard to Lyme disease, there is a national security slash intelligence slash military component to Lyme disease research. Uh, as we're going to see in the paper that I'm about to read, there are, are a number of different divergent views about Lyme disease. One has it that the disease is hard to catch and easily cured. The other is that, in fact, it is not hard to catch, easily cured, and that it can cause serious chronic neurological damage. Uh, one of the things that we're going to look at in connection with Lyme disease also is that there's a lot of dispute about exactly which tech, or there is uh, vague or contradictory information about just which ticks can disseminate the Lyme disease or related diseases, and also uh, the Borrelia bacteria, which uh, is basically what is responsible for Lyme disease, is a tick the born type of bacteria that also causes a number of different diseases. So exactly which Borrelia organism causes Lyme disease, whether Lyme disease is just one particular disease, uh, just what ticks spread the Borrelia disease, and uh, whether Lyme disease is really hard to catch and easily cured, or whether in fact it is a very, very serious affliction. Well, there, these are some of the controversies about Lyme disease research. However, much of Lyme disease research is controlled by a national security related entity called the EIS, the Epidemic Intelligence Service, and it is throughout the course of Lyme disease and research into it that we see elements of the EIS, the Epidemic Intelligence Service. There is a much less powerful and well-connected opposing camp called the ILADS, I-L-A-D-S camp, which opposes the notion, the official and government and national security supported notion that Lyme disease is hard to catch, easy to cure, and rarely causes chronic and neurological damage. The government-backed camp is the STEER camp, that's S-T-E-E-R-E. -E. The opposing camp is the ILADS camp. We're going to look at the uh, numerous disputes about Lyme disease, but remember the EIS, the Epidemic Intelligence Service, uh, and observe the extent to which biological warfare research or possible biological warfare application uh, is to be found at every turn of the course of the investigation into Lyme disease, and in fact in the phenomenon of Lyme disease itself. This paper is by Elena Cook, C -O, o K. Of course, it's called Lyme is a Biowarfare Issue, and in the introduction uh, to this paper, Ms. Cook writes, 
The world of Lyme disease medicine is split into two camps. The U.S. government-backed STEER camp, which maintains the disease is hard to catch, easily cured, and rarely causes chronic neurological damage, and the ILADS, or ILADS camp, which maintains the opposite. The STEER camp is intricately bound up with the American biowarfare establishment, as well as with giant insurance and other corporate interests with a stake in the issue. The ILADS doctors lack such connections, but are supported instead by tens of thousands of patients rallying behind them. Because the STEER camp has been massively funded and promoted by federal agencies, its view has dominated Lyme medicine not just in the U.S. but across much of the world. The result has been suffering on a grand scale. Below is a concise history of the military aspects of this cover-up. The next section is called Weapons of Mass Infection. The development of biological weapons has never been confined to dictatorships or quote, rogue, unquote, regimes. During the Second World War, America, Britain, and Canada collaborated closely on developing offensive bioweapons, and offensive research continued as an openly acknowledged activity of the U.S. scientific establishment during the Cold War. Only in 1972 was this work banned by international treaty. Meanwhile, the Maryland-based labs at Fort Detrick, for example, had produced millions of mosquitoes, ticks, and other vectors for the purpose of spreading lethal germs. The island of Greenard, off the coast of Scotland, was only declared habitable again in 1990, nearly 50 years after the, first Briti after the British first contaminated it during anthrax experiments. Ticks, which vector Lyme disease, have been studied as biowarfare instruments for decades. Such well-known biowar agents as tularemia and Q fever are tick-borne. The Borrelia genus of bacteria, which encompasses the Borrelia burgdorferi species group to which Lyme disease is attributed, was studied by the infamous World War II Japanese Biowarfare Unit 731, who carried out horrific experiments on prisoners in Manchuria, including dissection of live human beings. Unit 731 also worked on a number of other tick-borne pathogens. After the war, the butchers of Unit 731 were shielded from prosecution by the U.S. authorities who wanted their expertise for the Cold War. The U.S. government also protected and recruited German Nazi bioweaponeers under the aegis of the top-secret Operation Paperclip. Borreliosis, or infection with microbes belonging to the Borrelia genus, had been dreaded during the Second World War as a cause of the often fatal disease relapsing fever. The new post-war era of penicillin meant that many bacterial infections could now be easily cured. However, Borrelia, again parenthetically, that is the family of bacteria to which uh, the, d the organisms that cause Lyme disease belong. However, Borrelia were known for their ability to adopt different forms under conditions of stress, such as exposure to antibiotics. Shedding their outer wall, which is the target of penicillin and related drugs, they could ward off attack and continue to exist in the body. Lyme disease is not usually fatal, and it is sometimes argued that with rapidly lethal agents like smallpox and plague available, an army would have no interest in it. However, what is important to understand here is that incapacitating or non-lethal bioweapons are a major part of biowarfare research and development and have been for decades. For example, during the Second World War, brucellosis, chronically disabling but not usually fatal, was a major preoccupation. Military strategists understand that disabling an enemy's soldiers can sometimes cause more damage than killing them, as large, amount of re large amounts of resources are then tied up in caring for the casualties. An efficient incapacitating weapon dispersed over a civilian population could destroy a country's economy and infrastructure without firing a shot. People would either be too sick to work or too busy to look after those who were. EI, the EIS, <clears throat> the next section is entitled, The EIS, the Epidemic Intelligence Service, and the, quote, discovery, unquote, of Lyme. And Ms. Cook goes on. Modern Lyme history begins in 1975 when a mother in the town of Old Lyme, Connecticut, reported the outbreak of a strange multi-system disease. The town lies directly opposite the Plum Island Biowarfare Research Lab where, according to former justice official John Loftus, Nazi scientists brought to the U.S. after World War II may have test dropped, quote, poison ticks, unquote. It should be noted that Loftus's reputation for gathering accurate, 
hard-hitting information is strong, strong enough to bring down in disgrace the former Chancellor of Austria and Secretary General of the UN, Kurt Waldheim, after the latter's wartime record was revealed. While it's not yet known if Plum Island experimented on Lyme causing Borrelia, the lab's directors openly admitted to Michael Carroll, author of a recently published book which is endorsed by two former state governors, that they kept, quote, tick colonies, unquote. The hard tick, Ablioma americanum, known as a known carrier of Borrelia burgdorferi, was one of the subjects of the island's experiments. This tick is not the one most commonly associated with transmitting Borrelia burgdorferi, but it is implicated in harboring Borrelia lone starry, believed to be the cause of a Lyme-like illness, unquote, in the American South. That, by the way, is the lone star tick uh, native to Texas. We've been uh, getting infected with those quite a bit uh, here at the civic and governmental level in the United States in recent years, too, haven't we? Continuing, Carol's book reveals a shocking disregard for safety in this, a lab handling some of the most dangerous germs on Earth. Eyewitnesses described how infected animals were kept in open-air pens. Birds swooping down into the pens could have picked up and spread infected ticks worldwide. When Polly Murray made her now famous call to the Connecticut Health Department to report the strange epidemic among children and adults in her town, her initial reception was lukewarm. However, some weeks later, she got an unexpected call from a Dr. David Snydman of the Epidemic Intelligence Service, or EIS, who was very interested. He arranged for fellow EIS officer Dr. Alan Steer to get involved. By the time Mrs. Murray turned up for her appointment at Yale, the doctor she had expected to see had been relegated to the role of an onlooker. Alan Steer had taken charge, and his views were to shape the course of Lyme medicine for the next 30 years up till today. To understand the significance of all of this, we need a closer look at the Epidemic Intelligence Service, the EIS. The EIS, the Epidemic Intelligence Service, is an elite quasi-military unit of infectious disease experts set up in the 1950s to develop an offensive biowarfare capability. Despite the banning of offensive biowar in the 1970s, the crack troops of the EIS continue to exist ostensibly for non-offensive research into emerging disease threats, a blanket phrase covering both bioweapon attacks and natural epidemics at the same time. Graduates of the EIS training program are sent in to occupy strategic positions in the U.S. health infrastructure, taking leadership at federal and state health agencies in academia, industry, and the media. The organization also extends its influence abroad, training officers for public health agencies in Britain, France, the Netherlands, and elsewhere around the world. Again, but let me interrupt here briefly to emphasize what we were just talking about here. Uh, this, what is described by Ms. Cook as an elite quasi-military unit of infectious disease experts, uh, basically trains people who are then set in to occupy strategic positions in the U.S. health infrastructure. It's a very, very interesting organization. They dominate Lyme disease research, but uh, this is not an institution about which one hears a great deal. Certainly uh, in the modern age in particular, having people in the health establishment who are knowledgeable about and can function in conjunction with uh, any sort of potential biological warfare uh, or bioterror threat, certainly that's an essential component. This is a particularly interesting institution, however, and uh, uh, just exactly why it is so deeply involved with Lyme disease research, which is ostensibly not that uh, big a deal. Well, the disease itself supposedly is not that big a deal. Uh, it's not clear from this paper why that's the case, but certainly uh, throughout the course of the investigation into Lyme disease, the possibility of uh, the fact that it's derivative in one way or another, intentionally or otherwise, from biological warfare research is uh, certainly something that needs to be carefully considered. And in any event, at every turn with regard to research into Lyme disease, one finds people involved with such kinds of research. Continuing, 
In fact, a high proportion of steer camp lime experts are involved with the EIS. Bear in mind, this is the government's powerful uh, Lyme disease ain't so bad section. Beginning again, in fact, a high proportion of steer camp Lyme experts are involved with the EIS. Given that the EIS is a small, elite force, in 2001, the Center for Disease Control revealed that there were less than 2,500 EIS officers in existence since the unit was first created in 1951. So its whole history is 2,500. It seems incredible that so many of America's top infectious disease experts would devote their careers to what they themselves claim is a hard-to-catch, easily cured, unquote, disease. Within a few years of Steer's discovery, unquote, of Lyme disease, the unique Lyme rash and certain associated symptoms had been recognized in Europe nearly a century before, it was announced that its bacterial cause had been identified. The microbe was accidentally found by biowarfare scientist Vili Bergdorfer and was subsequently named for him. Bergdorfer has championed the Lyme disease patients movement and is not suspected of any wrongdoing. However, it is not impossible that he was unwittingly caught up in a chain of events that were not as random as they might have seemed. Bergdorfer was a Swiss scientist who had been recruited by the U.S. Public Health Service in the 1950s. He was highly experienced with both ticks and Borrelia, but after being told that the government was not interested in funding work with the latter, he switched to work with Rickettsia and other pathogens. In 1981, Bergdorfer was sent a batch of deer ticks by a team studying Rocky Mountain spotted fever on the East Coast. In charge of the team was one Dr. Jorge Benach. Benach subsequently spent much of his career as a steer camp Lyme researcher. In 2004, he was chosen as recipient for a $3 million biowarfare research grant. Cutting open some of Benock's ticks, Bergdorfer noticed microfilaria, or microscopic worm young. This was a subject he had been studying recently, only these microfilaria were different. They were exceptionally large, large enough to be seen with the naked eye. His curiosity naturally piqued, he opened up several more ticks. There, he was surprised to find the spiral-shaped germs of Borrelia. Cultivation is necessary in order to isolate bacteria for study so that diagnostic tests, vaccines, or cures can be developed. Borrelia are very difficult to grow in culture. However, by lucky coincidence, unquote, another scientist had recently joined the lab where he worked and had apparently been involved in an amazing breakthrough in this area. So naturally, Bergdorfer handed the infected ticks over to him. That scientist was Dr. Alan Barber, an officer like Steer and Snydman of the Epidemic Intelligence Service with a, background, uh, with a background in work on anthrax, one of the most terrifying biowarfare agents known. EIS man Barber, therefore, became the first to isolate the prototype organism on which all subsequent Lyme disease blood tests would be based. This is very significant as a huge body of evidence indicates the unreliability of these tests which are routinely used to rule out the disease. Additionally, all DNA detection of the Lyme agent in ticks and animals is ultimately based directly or indirectly on the genetic profile of the strain first isolated by Barber, again of the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Continuing. Shortly after Barber's discovery, other species and strains of the Lyme-causing bacteria were isolated, especially in Europe. They were all classified based on their re resemblance to Barber's organism and have been grouped into a category called Borrelia burgdorferi sensu latu, or BBSL for short. However, a Borrelia was subsequently found in the southern U.S., referred to briefly above, which appears not to be a member of Barber's BBSL group at all. The bacteria, named Borrelia lone starry, often evades detection on Lyme blood tests, is not found using DNA tests, and does not grow in Barber's culture medium, which is used worldwide for lab study. And yet, it appears to cause an illness identical to Lyme, down to the bullseye rash, which, though not present in all patients, is considered unique to Lyme disease. In 2005, Barber who spent much of his career studying, studying the hard-to-catch, easy-to-cure Lyme disease, was placed in charge of the new multi-million new biowarfare mega-complex based at the University of California at Irvine. 
Barber is joined there by his close colleague and fellow steerite Jonas Bunikas, author of recent papers calling for a restrictive approach to Lyme diagnosis. The next section here is called The Spread and the Spin. By the late 1980s, it was realized that Lyme disease was rapidly spreading out of control. Cases were reported across America, Europe, and Asia. Federal health agencies launched a major propaganda effort to limit, diagnosis, uh, to limit diagnosis and so artificially contain the epidemic. The National Institute of Health, or NIH, appointed biowarfare expert Edward McSweegan as Lyme program officer. Under his leadership, the diagnostic criteria was skewed to exclude most sufferers, especially those with chronic neurological illness. McSweegan's successor at NIH, Dr. Phil Baker, is an anthrax expert and has continued his policies. The Center for Disease Control is another federal body which has had a major impact on how Lyme is diagnosed and treated. Its influence extends abroad with European public health departments drawing up policies based on CDC guidelines. It should be remembered that it is the CDC which trains the Epidemic Intelligence Service and much of the leadership of the CDC has traditionally been drawn from EIS ranks. Therefore, it comes as no surprise to learn that David Dennis, the head of the Vector-Borne Diseases Research Program at CDC, with math, massive influence over Lyme issues, was involved with the EIS. However, we could legitimately wonder why at lower levels of the CDC hierarchy, EIS officers, the nation's heavyweight infectious disease experts, continue to play such a major role in investigating the supposedly hard-to-catch, easily cured Lyme. For example, EIS officers Martin Schriefer and Captain Paul Mead. In 2001, responded, responding to the protest of thousands of patients that standard two- or three-week antibiotic courses were not sufficient, the NIH commissioned biowarfare scientist Mark Klempner to study persistence of Lyme infection. ILADS doctors had found that patients left untreated in the early phase often needed long courses of antibiotics, sometimes for years. Klempner, however, concluded that persistent Lyme infection did not exist. In 2003, Klempner was appointed head of the new $1.6 billion biowarfare top security facility being developed at Boston University. Shortly after, the news emerged that there had been an escape of the deadly bug tularemia, which was not properly reported to the authorities. In 2005, the author discovered a document on the NIH website listing Lyme as one of the potential bioterrorism agents study in, studied in BSL-4 top security labs. After this was publicized, the NIH announced that they had made a mistake, unquote, and removed the words Lyme disease from the page. At the time of writing, the original is still available in cached Internet archives. However, at around the same time, a CDC source leaked the identical information to the Associated Press. Moreover, the Science Coalition, comprising entities as prestigious as the American Medical Association, Yale University, and the American Red Cross, maintains a website which at the time of writing also lists Lyme as a disease studied for its biowarfare potential. Could these three major organizations all have coincidentally made the same mistake? In 2004, the UK government denied that Lyme was a threat in Britain and told Parliament that no Lyme research had been conducted since 1999. Yet the report of the official UK delegation to an international conference on the prevention of bioterrorism revealed that Lyme was being studied at Port and Down, Britain's top biowarfare facility. Britain and many other European countries take their lead on Lyme from a body called EUCALB, rooted in steer camp methodology. NATO has also been directly involved in moves to harmonize European Lyme diagnosis along steerite lines. Lyme's ability to evade detection on routine medical tests, its myriad, pre its myriad presentations which can baffle doctors by mimicking a hundred different diseases, its amazing abilities to evade the immune system and antibiotic treatment would make it an attractive choice to bioweaponeers looking for an incapacitating agent. 
Lyme's abilities as the great imitator, unquote, might mean that an attack could be misinterpreted as simply a rise in the incidence of different naturally occurring diseases such as autism, MS, lupus, and chronic, fati chronic fatigue syndrome, or ME. Borrelia's inherent ability to swap outer surface proteins, which may also vary widely from strain to strain, would make the production of an effective vaccine extremely difficult. A vaccine developed by the public, by, for the public by the Steer Camp in collaboration with GlaxoSmithKline was pulled from the market a few years ago amid class action lawsuits. Finally, the delay before the appearance of the most incapacitating symptoms would allow plenty of time for an attacker to move away from the scene, as well as preventing people in a contaminated zone from realizing that they had been infected and seeking treatment. Often in the early period, there is no rash, only vague flu-like or other nonspecific symptoms, which might be dismissed by GPs or ignored by the patient. The 2003 proposal for a rapid detection method for biowarfare by Dr. J.J. Dunn of Brookhaven National Lab seems to add further grounds for suspicion. It is based on the use of two sentinel germs, plague and Lyme. In 1999, Lyme patient advocacy leader Pat Smith was amazed to find on visiting an army base at an old biowar testing ground in Maryland that the U.S. Department of Defense has developed a satellite-linked system that enables soldiers to read in real time off a display on their helmet's visor information about the rate of Lyme-infected ticks wherever they may be on Earth. Unit commanders could update the database using state-of-the-art portable PCR machines, which test for Lyme DNA in soldiers bitten by ticks. The use of such cutting-edge te cutting technology for a supposedly hard-to-catch, easy-to-cure illness seems odd, to say the least. Lyme is often complicated by, co by the presence of co-infecting diseases in the same tick, e.g. those caused by the microbes of Babesia, Bartonella, and mycoplasma, believed by some researchers to be the cause of Gulf War illness, Ehrlichia, Microfilaria, and Encephalitis viruses. Investigations into some of these, too, have been led by American biowarfare experts. It could be argued that some of these Lyme researchers have been awarded biowar-related grants simply because they are infectious disease specialists, which is a natural terrain from which to recruit. After all, research budgets for biowar have ballooned massively since the anthrax attacks of 2001. There's a, there is a demand for large numbers of personnel to work on such projects. Well, there are two things that could be said here. First, researchers who have spent much or most of their careers studying a, studying a hard-to-catch, easily-cured disease would not appear to be the best choice as recipients of this type of grant unless the easily-cured disease had some relation to biowarfare. Second, while some infectious disease specialists began to study the organisms for the first time after 2001, this is not necessarily the case with the steroids. That's all we have time for right now, and I'm, I will put up the rest of this paper on, in the description for the broadcast. That will be available at www.spitfirelist.com. This concludes side two of For the Record program number 585. But Lyme disease and biological warfare research, this has been recorded on February 11th of the year 2007. My name is Dave Emery. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and this is side one of For the Record program number 585, titled Update on Biological Warfare and Lyme Disease. This is being recorded on February 11th of the year 2007. Uh, let me begin by encouraging listeners, uh, and most emphatically, to utilize the tremendous amount of information that is available on the Internet. Those of you who only listen to the program itself, are missing the greater part of the for the record experience to coin a term because there is a tremendous amount of information available on the Spitfire website and linked websites and so please utilize that vast and growing body of information. Uh, each program gets turned into a long article length description. There is literally a mini library of old anti-fascist books available and uh, just a tremendous a blog sphere, uh, a search engine, just about anything that uh, 
uh, one could want. Plus, of course, WFMU is archiving the broadcasts on real audio and also on MP3. So all of the For the Record shows are available on audio on the uh, WFMU websites. Spitfire also features uh, the last four For the Record broadcasts for download only. So please use the information that's available online. It'll help to flesh out people's understanding. Now, what we're going to do on this broadcast is to once again resume and to a certain extent review uh, a line of inquiry that we have engaged in before, specifically in For the Record program number 480 from October of 2004. Uh, we, In that broadcast, we took a look at an apparent historical relationship between not only biological warfare research in the United States, but specifically research done on the Plum Island facility in the post-World War II period, research involving the use of ticks as disease vectors for biological warfare research purposes, and also uh, the research done there in that context by someone named Eric Traub. Eric Traub had been in charge of virological and biological warfare for the Third Reich. He reported directly to Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS. His program was was conducted under the guise of being an anti-cancer program or a cancer research program. Uh, Eric Traub was brought into the United States at the end of World War II under the auspices of Project Paperclip, and that is where our inquiry is going to begin. Uh, most of the second side of the program uh, is going to consist of a reading of an article that discusses some relatively recent developments, namely the fact that Lyme disease research in this country has been uh, overseen and regulated by uh, elements associated with uh, both countermeasures for biological warfare research and biological warfare research itself. Uh, one of the interesting things about biological warfare research is the fact that to a large extent any f distinction between offensive and defensive biological warfare research is academic because when one is examining the principles by which microorganisms cause disease, uh, one is simply doing that research, whether it has a an offensive or a defensive application, the root research is identical. So that's something to bear in mind. Another point of information here, Plum Island, which is going to figure prominently in the first part of the broadcast, that is a U.S. government laboratory that was set up specifically to do research into animal diseases. It is officially under the auspices of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or was. It also doubled as a military biological warfare research facility. And uh, one of the points to note about biological warfare research before we plunge in here is that animal disease research, veterinary pathogenic research, uh, is very, very prominent in biological warfare research. Veterinary medicine figures prominently in biological warfare research among, for, among other reasons, the fact that uh, in the veterinarians are not bound by the Hippocratic Oath. Something to think about. In any event, we're going to begin with a discussion of Project Paperclip and the genesis of Eric Traub's work for the United States government on Plum Island in connection with Lyme disease. We're going to be reading now from the book Lab 257, The Disturbing Story of the Government's Secret Plum Island Germ Laboratory by Michael Christopher Carroll. Uh, the book was published in hardcover by Harper Collins. And of Project Paperclip, Mr. Carroll writes... Nearing the end of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union raced to recruit German scientists for post-war purposes. Under a top-secret program codenamed Project Paperclip, the U.S. military pursued Nazi scientific talent, quote, like forbidden fruit, unquote, bringing them to America under employment contracts and offering them full U.S. citizenship. 
The recruits were supposed to be nominal participants in Nazi activities, but the zealous military recruited more than 2,000 scientists, many of whom had dark Nazi party pasts. American scientists viewed these Germans as peers and quickly forgot they were on opposite sides of a ghastly global war in which millions perished. Fearing brutal retaliation from the Soviets for the Nazis' vicious treatment of them, some scientists cooperated with the Americans to earn amnesty. Others played the two nations off each other to get the best financial deal in exchange for their services. Dr. Eric Traub was troubling on the Soviet side of the Iron Curtain after the war and ordered to research germ warfare viruses for the Russians. He pulled off a daring escape with his family to West Berlin in 1949. Applying for Project Paperclip employment, Traub affirmed he wanted to do scientific work in the USA, become an American citizen, and be, rep be protected from Russian reprisals, unquote. As lab chief of Incel Reims, I-N-S-E-L-R-I-E-M-S, -E -E a secret Nazi biological warfare laboratory on a crescent-shaped island nestled in the Baltic Sea, Traub worked directly for Adolf Hitler's second in charge, SS Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler, on live germ trials. More about Eric Traub, but Eric Traub, before we continue with his, in, in basically his indoctrination, his uh, inculcation, his induction into the U.S. national security establishment, uh, he had actually been in the United States and had been hanging out at uh, uh, organizations involved with promoting German Americans into uh, a Nazi or prodding German Americans into a Nazi direction. Uh, turning once again to Lab 257, Traub also listed his 1930s membership in America Deutsche Volksbund, a German-American, quote, club, unquote, also known as Camp Siegfried. Just 30 miles west of Plum Island in Yafank, Long Island, Camp Siegfried was the national headquarters of the American Nazi movement. Ironically, Traub spent the pre-war period of his scientific career on a fellowship at the Rockefeller Institute in Princeton, New Jersey, perfecting his skills in viruses and bacteria under the tutelage of American experts before returning to Nazi Germany on the eve of war. Despite Traub's troubling war record, the U.S. Navy recruited him for its scientific designs and stationed him at the Naval Medical Research Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. And uh, now something about... Uh, Project Paperclip, and uh, Dr. Dr. Traub's work for it, again from Lab 257, just months into his paperclip contract, the germ warriors of Fort Detrick, the Army's biological warfare headquarters in Frederick, Maryland, and CIA operatives invited Traub in for a talk, later reported in a declassified top-secret summary. Dr. Traub is a noted authority on viruses and diseases in Germany and Europe. This interrogation revealed much information of value to the animal disease program from a biological warfare point of view. Traub discussed work done at a German animal disease station during World War II and subsequent to the war when the station was under Russian control. Traub's detailed explanation of the secret operation on incel reams and his activities there during the war and for the Soviets laid the groundwork for Fort Detrick's offshore germ warfare animal disease lab on diseases lab on Plum Island. Traub was a founding father. So uh, Eric Traub in charge of virological and biological warfare or virological and bacteriological warfare for the Third Reich, a man who reported directly to Heinrich Himmler, one of the quote founding fathers unquote of uh, the genesis, uh, basically, at present at the birth of one of the founding fathers of Plum Island and its liaison with biological warfare, its involvement in biological warfare research. Uh, still more, again from Lab 257. Everybody seemed, to, seemed willing to forget about Eric Traub's dirty past, that he played a crucial role in the Nazis' quote, cancer research program, unquote, the cover name for their biological warfare program, and that he worked directly under SS Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler. They seemed willing to overlook that Traub in the 1930s faithfully attempted Camp Siegfried. In fact, 
The USDA liked him so much it glossed over his dubious past and offered him the top scientist job at the new Plum Island Laboratory not once, but twice. Just months after the 1952 public hearings on selecting Plum Island, Doc Shea dialed Dr. Traub at the Naval Laboratory to discuss plans for establishing the germ laboratory and a position on Plum Island. And still more about Eric Traub and Plum Island. Six years later, and only two years after Traub squirmed in his seat at the Plum Island dedication ceremonies, senior scientist Dr. Jacob Traum retired. The USDA needed someone of outstanding caliber with a long-established reputation internationally as well as nationally, unquote, to fill Dr. Traum's shoes. But somehow, it couldn't find a suitable American. Quote, as a last resort, it is now proposed that a foreigner be employed. The Aggies' choice? Eric Traub, who was in their view, quote, the most desirable candidate from any source, unquote. The 1958 secret USDA memorandum, Justification for Employment of Dr. Eric Traub, unquote, conveniently omitted his World War II activities, but it did emphasize that, quote, his originality, scientific abilities, and general competence as an investigator, unquote, were developed at the Rockefeller Institute in New Jersey at the night in the 1930s. And still more, uh, the omission of Traub's uh, work for the Third Reich uh, certainly did not uh, hinder his professional rise. Again, from Lab 257, quote, The letters supporting Traub to lead Plum Island came in from fellow Plum Island founders, quote, I hope that every effort will be made to get him. He has had long and productive experience in both pre-war and post-war Germany, unquote, said Dr. William Hagen, dean of the Cornell University Veterinary School, carefully dispensing with his wartime activities. The final word came from his dear American friend and old Rockefeller Institute boss, Dr. Richard, Richard Shope, who described Traub as careful, skilled, productive, and very original, and, quote, one of this world's most outstanding virologists. Shope's sole reference to Traub at war, quote, during the war, he was in Germany serving in the German army, unquote. And uh, Traub declined the offer to lead the lab, but there is considerable evidence that he was deeply involved with the uh, research that was going on there, including, as we will see, research that may have involved ticks as vectors, including possibly Lyme disease. Again, from Lab 257, declining the USDA's offer, Traub continued his directorship of the Tübingen Laboratory in West Germany, though he visited Plum Island frequently. In 1960, he was forced to resign as Tübingen's director under a dark cloud of financial embezzlement. Traub continued sporadic lab research for another three years and then left Tübingen for good, a scandalous end to a checkered career. In the late 1970s, the esteemed virologist Dr. Robert Shope on business in Munich paid his father Richard's old Rockefeller Institute disciple a visit. The germ warrior had been in early retirement for about a decade by then. Quote, I had dinner with Traub one day, out of old time's sake, and he was a pretty defeated man by then, unquote. Quote, on May 18, 1985, the Nazi virus warrior Dr. Eric Traub died unexpectedly in his sleep in West Germany. He was 78 years old. A biological warfare mercenary who worked under three flags, Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, and the United States, Traub was never investigated for war crimes. He escaped any inquiry into his wartime past. The full extent of his sordid endeavors went with him to his grave. While America brought a handful of Nazi war criminals to justice, it safeguarded many others in exchange for verses to the new state religion, modern science, and espionage. Records detailing a fraction of Eric Traub's activities are now available to the public, but most are withheld by Army intelligence and the CIA on grounds of national security. But there's enough of a glimpse to draw quite a sketch. And then... Uh, uh, Mr. Carroll goes on to talk about John Loftus and some of his research, which pointed in the direction of Traub slash Plum Island research, 
as uh, a source of a lot of trouble, possibly, as we'll see, uh, the intentional or perhaps accidental dissemination of Lyme disease. Attorney John Loftus was hired in 1979 by the Office of Special Investigations, a unit set up by the Justice Department to expose Nazi war crimes and unearth Nazis hiding in the United States. Given top-secret clearance to review files that had been sealed for 35 years, Loftus found a treasure trove of information on America's post-war Nazi recruiting. In 1982, publicly challenging the government's complacency with the wrongdoing, he told 60 Minutes that top Nazi officers had been protected and harbored in America by the CIA and the State Department. They got the Emmy Award, Loftus wrote. My family got the death threats. Old spies reached out to him after the publication of his book, The Ballara Secret, encouraged that he, unlike other authors, submitted his manuscript to the government, agreeing to censor portions to protect national security. The spooks gave him copies of secret documents and told him stories of clandestine operations. From these leads, Loftus ferreted out the dubious Nazi past of Austrian President and UN Secretary General Kurt Waldheim, and parenthetically uh, also a longtime political ally of Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Continuing, Loftus revealed that during World War II, Waldheim had been an officer in a German army unit that committed atrocities in Yugoslavia. A disgraced Kurt Waldheim faded from the international scene soon thereafter. In the preface of the Ballara secret, Loftus laid out a striking piece of information gleaned from his spy network. Even more disturbing are the records of the Nazi germ warfare scientists who came to America. They experimented with poison ticks dropped from planes to spread rare diseases. I have received some information suggesting that the U.S. tested some of these poison ticks on the Plum Island artillery range off the coast of Connecticut during the early 1950s. Most of the germ warfare records have been shredded, but there is a top-secret U.S. document confirming that, quote, clandestine attacks on crops and animals, unquote, took place at this time, unquote. And still more. Eric Traub had been working for the American Biological Warfare Program from his 1949 Soviet escape until 1953. We know he consulted with Fort Detrick scientists and CIA operatives that he worked for the USDA for a brief stint, and that he spoke regularly with Plum Island director Doc Shayan in 1952. Traub can be physically placed on Plum Island at least three times, on Dedication Day in 1956, and two visits, once in 1957 and again in the spring of 1958. Shayan, who enforced an ultra-strict policy against outside visitors, each time received special clearance from the State Department to allow Traub on Plum Island soil. And uh, still more. Research unearthed three USDA files from the vault of the National Archives. Two were labeled Tick Research and a third Eric Traub. All three folders were empty. The caked on dust confirms the file boxes hadn't been opened since the moment before they were taped shut in the 1950s. Preposterous as it sounds, clandestine outdoor germ warfare trials were almost routine during this period. In 1952, the Joint Chiefs of Staff called for a vigorous, well-planned, large-scale biological warfare test to the Secretary of Defense later that year, stated, Steps should be taken to make certain that adequate facilities are available, including those at Fort Detrick, Dugway Proving Ground, Fort Terry, or Plum Island, and an island field testing area, unquote. Was Plum Island the island field testing area? Indeed, when the Army first scouted Plum Island for its biological, for its Cold War designs, they charted wind speeds and direction and found that much to their liking, the prevailing winds blew out to sea. One of the participating interested agencies was the USDA, which admittedly set up large plots of land throughout the Midwest for airborne anti-crop germ spray tests. Fort Detrick's Special Operations Division ran vulnerability tests, unquote, in which operatives walked around Washington, D.C. and San Francisco with suitcases holding Serratia marcescens, a bacteria recommended to Fort Detrick by Traub's nominal supervisor, Nazi germ czar and Nuremberg defendant Dr. Kurt Blom. 
Tiny perforations allowed the germs release so that they could trace the flow of the germs through airports and bus terminals. Shortly thereafter, 11 elderly men and women checked into hospitals with never-before-seen serratia marcescens infections. One patient died. Decades later, when the germ tests were disclosed, the Army denied responsibility. In the summer of 1966, Special Operations men walked into three New York City subway stations and tossed light bulbs filled with Bacillus subtilis of benign bacteria onto the tracks. The subway trains pushed the germs through the entire system and theoretically killed over a million passengers." Unquote. Tests were also run with live, virulent anti-animal germ agents. Two hog cholera bombs were exploded at an altitude of 1,500 feet over pig pens set up at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, and turkey feathers laced with Newcastle disease virus were dropped on animals grazing on a University of Wisconsin farm. The Army never fully withdrew its germ warfare efforts against food animals. Two years after the Army gave Plum Island to the USDA, and three years after it told President Eisenhower it had ended all biological warfare tests against food animals, the Joint Chiefs advised that research on anti-animal agent munition combinations should, unquote, continue as well as field testing of anti-food agent munition combinations, unquote. In November of 1957, military intelligence examined the elimination of the food supply of the Sino-Soviet bloc right down to the calories required for victory. Quote, In order to have a crippling effect on the economy of the USSR, the food and animal crop resources of the USSR would have to be damaged within a single growing season to the extent necessary to reduce the present average calor daily caloric intake from 2,800 calories to 1,400 calories, i.e. the starvation level. Reduction of food resources to this level, if maintained for 12 months, would produce 20% fatalities and would decrease manual labor performance by 95% and clerical and light labor performance by 80%. At least six outdoor stockyard tests occurred in 1964 and 65. Stimulants were sprayed into stockyards at Fort Worth, Kansas City, St. Louis, Sioux Falls, and Omaha in tests determining how much foot and mouth disease virus would be required to destroy the food supply. Had the Army commandeered Plum Island for an outdoor trial? Maybe the USDA lent a hand with the trial as it had done out west by furnishing the large field tests. After all, the Plum Island agreement between the Army and the USDA allowed the Army to borrow the island from the USDA when necessary and in, when in the national interest. Traub might have monitored the tests. A source who worked on Plum Island in the 1950s recalls that animal handlers and a scientist released ticks outdoors on the island. By the way, uh, interrupting, these tests, of course, tests of ticks on, the, on Plum Island. Traub might have monitored the tests. A source who worked on Plum Island in the 1950s recalls that animal handlers and a scientist released ticks outdoors on the island. They called him the Nazi scientist. When they came in in 1951, they were inoculating these ticks, unquote, and a picture he once saw shows the animal handler pointing to the area on Plum where they released the ticks, unquote. Dr. Traub's World War II handiwork consisted of aerial virus sprays developed on Ansel Reims and tested over occupied Russia and of field work for Heinrich Himmler in Turkey. Indeed, his colleagues conducted bug trials by dropping live beetles from planes. An outdoor tick trial would have been de rigueur for Eric Trau. And uh, one of the people involved here with early research into the possible Lyme connection here is a, gu a guy named Steve Nostrum. <clears throat> Somebody gave Steve Nostrum a copy of John Loftus's The Ballara Secret in one of his support group meetings. Steve had long suspected that Plum Island played a role in the evolution of Lyme disease, given the nature of its business and its proximity to Old Lyme, Connecticut. But he never publicly voiced that hunch, fearing a loss of credibility. Hard facts and stati statistics earned him a reputation as a leader in the Lyme disease field. Now, in his hands, he had a book written by a Justice Department attorney who not only had appeared on 60 Minutes, but also had brought down the Secretary General of the United Nations. 
Nostrum disclosed the possible plum lime connection on his own television show. He invited local news reporter and Plum Island ombudsman Carl Grossman to help him explore the possibilities in light of the island's biological mishaps. Asked why he wrote about Loftus's book in his weekly newspaper column, Grossman says, to let the theory rise or fall, to let the public consider it. And it seemed to me that the author was a Nazi hunter and a reputable, attor a reputable attorney. This was not trivial information provided, and it was provided by some reliable person. In October of 1995, Nostrum, fresh off nursing duty, having earned an RN degree to help Lyme disease patients, rushed to a rare public meeting held by the USDA. In a white nurse's coat, steth stethoscope still around his neck, Nostrum rose. Trembling, his blonde beard now streaked with gray, he clutched his copy of the Ballara Secret as he read the damning passage out loud for the USDA and the public to hear. I don't know whether this is true, he said, looking at the dais. If it is true, there must be an investigation. If it's not true, then John Loftus needs to be prosecuted. People in the audience clapped, and some were astonished. A few gawked, thinking he was nuts. How did the official USDA officials react? If stairs could kill, I would have been dead, remembers Nostrum. Hiding behind the same aloof veil of secrecy they had employed for decades, the USDA brazenly cut him off. There are those who think that little green men are hiding out there, an official responded to Nostrum, but trust us when we say there are no space aliens and no five-legged cows. A few laughs erupted in the crowd. It did nothing but detract from what I was saying, said Nostrum, but I said it, and I had the documentation to support it. And still later, Carol talked, goes on. If Dr. Traub continued his outdoor germ experiments with the Army and, ex and experimented with ticks outdoors, the ticks would have made contact with mice, deer, and more than 140 species of wild birds known to frequent and nest on Plum Island. The birds spread their toxic cargo to resting and nesting perches atop the great elms and oaks of Old Lyme and elsewhere, just like they spread the West Nile virus throughout the United States. Uh, and more about uh, this particular uh, uh, connection will be in the description to this particular broadcast. And again, please do use the website, the Spitfire website at www.spitfirelist.com and link websites, a vast and growing source of research with a blog sphere, a mini library of anti-fascist books, and vast amounts of other information, audio and print. This concludes side one of For the Record program number 585, titled uh, Lyme Disease and Biological Warfare. This program is being recorded on February 11th of the year 2007. My name is Dave Emery. Thanks for listening.